moving on to our next speaker now, Martin Kolkhoff. Martin is head of uh, sports recovery at Help for Heroes. He joined the charity in 2011, having served in the army from the age of 16, firstly in the parachute regiment and latterly in the Royal Army Physical Training Corps. Martin was the senior Paralympic performance manager at the UK Athletics during 2006 and 7. In 2008, he helped establish the MODS Battleback program at Headley Court with Help for Heroes. Martin also oversees research into the impact of sport and exercise interventions in the recovery of wounded, ill, and injured military veterans. Active therapy and research. Martin Kolkhoff. So over the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about um, the program that I'm responsible for, but also take a bit of a, a look backwards to some of the uh, people who started to have this great insight of how valuable sport could be in the recovery of injured service men and women. And it probably goes back further than you think. I'll also look at the sort of frameworks that we've developed over the last 10 years so that you can pick the bones out of that. And if you think there's anything that's going to be of any use to apply within your own settings, then they're yours to take away as a free gift from me. We'll also look at some evidence, um, but evidence in the form of evaluation rather than some hard research. Some of the research we're doing at the mo moment is unpublished, so um, we're not really going to talk about it too much, but at least I'll be able to show you a couple of graphs to satisfy the uh, researchers in the room. And then I'll look at what, where some of the trends are, are going in the UK experience. So the use of a sport as recovery in the military community goes back to the First World War when over 752,000 uh, people came back from war with permanent disabilities. And these activities started at one of our sort of pre-NHS hospitals, and that's a hospital in Roehampton, which still exists and is a centre of excellence for supporting amputees. But in uh, 1915, they used to hold sports competitions there. So this idea that the Paralympic movement and the Invictus Games is, is novel it is not true. I mean, we've built these events on the shoulders of giants that went before us. And I have a little sort of video clip of some of the early activities that used to take place at Roehampton Hospital. They were football, cricket, tug of war, wheelchair racing, and uh, this is a Pathé News clip from the time. So being good military types, um, we made our amputees march <laughs> in two ranks <laughs> with their auxiliary crutches. Like the amputees of today, they love showing off the latest technology and prosthetics. Wearing shorts has become a fashion amongst the amputee po population. And perhaps the most enjoyable of all of the things they did was playing the nurses at football. Something I think we should bring back. Um, we've not done too much of that. But what it shows to me is that actually connecting to the local community, and the nurses were obviously from the local community, was really important. Tug of war, not something we've tried at an Invictus Games yet with amputees, uh, but it's a novel concept and uh, we're looking into it. We ordinarily think of Ludwig Gutmann as being the founder of um, you know, modern day sport as part of the rehabilitation process for, uh, for servicemen particularly. And in Ludwig Gutmann's case, it was those returning from the Second World War with spinal cord injuries and a very poor, poor prognosis. And right from the get-go, they started to consider the needs of those with disabilities and came up with some new novel sports like wheelchair basketball, for example. And also, um, it actually takes a nod to my profession, where physical training instructors from the military were very much part of that rehabilitation process then, in the Second World War, as they are today in modern times. One of Gutmann's most inspired ideas was to get wheelchair patients playing competitive sport as a way of improving fitness, boosting self-esteem and restoring personal dignity. So it's a very short video, but it shows some of the key things that we're still trying to promote today. That issue of improving self-esteem and personal dignity is, is vital as part of the recovery process. But in uh, sort of modern day terms, we started to really consider 
uh, how we might meet the needs of our returning servicemen and women with injuries during um, or on the back of the injuries that came out of Iraq and Afghanistan from 2008 onwards. A colonel in the British Army called Fred Hargreaves decided it'd be a really good idea to um, run a ski expedition alongside an already existing military uh, activity, which is Exercise Snow Warrior, which takes place in Bavaria every year. The great thing about this was it was a really great example of running an integrated program right from the get-go. So the very first program that we ran was integrated with able-bodied programs. It actually showed those who'd escaped being injured um, during the time they'd spent on operations could still do cool stuff. They could still learn new skills, they could still integrate with their able-bodied peers, and they could still feel part of a unit or a community again. Two posts were established at the Rehabilitation Centre in Headley Court, and the focus at the time was very much on that complex trauma group between sort of 2008 and 2010. And that was all done with funding from the organisation that I work for, Help for Heroes. In 2011, the Royal British Legion, which I believe is akin to the RSL over here in Australia, also decided that sport was something that they wanted to invest in and using sport as that tool for recovery and personal development um, was established and they established a centre in Lillishall, which is one of our national sports centres in the UK. Uh, it's quite expensive to run, but they're having great outcomes from the programme and have recently op opened that to veterans. But it soon became apparent to me that well, there's a large community of people that weren't really being able to access these programmes readily. And that, that community were those with uh, conditions other than complex trauma. So other chronic health conditions, be they physical health conditions like MS, stroke, or whatever, and mental health conditions as well. So I jumped ship for a second time in 2011 from the Army, joined Help for Heroes, and established the Sports Recovery Programme. We opened it up immediately to all wounded, injured and sick personnel across all three service, services, both active duty and veterans. A, set, a, a network of four recovery centres were established and we got considerable support through our national governing bodies and our National Paralympic Federation, the British Paralympic Association. And over the period of eight years between 2011 and now, we've offered an opportunity for people to take part in over 80 different sports. Ev from everything as ridiculous as ballooning to things that aren't really sports like golf. We're here to serve, and if people want to waste their time on golf courses, we'll facilitate that for them. We've developed a framework that we think is pretty broad and deep. It includes a package of recreational sporting activities, uh, which are really aimed at um, enhancing sort of physical, psychological, and social recovery. We provide a pathway for potentially talented athletes. Uh, David mentioned a couple as members of the Kazivak Club who we've supported to become Paralympians. And since 2008, uh, when there were two uh, athletes competing in the Paralympic Games in Beijing with a military background, through to Rio in 2016, where there were 16 athletes from a military background shows the, the success of that particular part of the program. It's the very pointy end and beneath that that's an awful lot of recreational uh, engagement taking place as well. Competitive sport is a key part of the offer and we have a number of competitive sports teams and competitive programs um, available and we also offer qualifications and awards. Many people now want to give something back. Um, David's giving back his time and his experience and his expertise and many of the veterans that I come across also want to do the same. So many are now starting to want to gain coaching qualifications and become our coaches of the future. In fact at the last Warrior Games all of our coaches were veterans who'd come through our sports recovery program rather than being national governing body coaches drawn in from the national governing body pool. So it's mates helping mates uh, would be a good way of describing that. I think we're all very familiar with the three core benefits of sports programs. Those are the physical benefits, the psychological benefits, and the social benefits. 
Uh, the psychological benefits are demonstrated by the, the smile on this young lady's face. In fact, I met a mum recently who thanked me for giving her her daughter back um, because that's how important sport had become as part of her life. And she was now quoting her mum, a delight to live with rather than being someone she really didn't want to be around for a while. I, th I don't think they wanted to be around each other, to be fair. And then the social benefits of sport can't be underestimated either. If we were to be a bit geeky and kind of put a bit of a, sci a scientific framework around this, a theoretical framework, then self-determination theory, I think, comes into play quite often within our, our programs. And the bit that I'm most passionate about within that model is the bit in the center. It's that elements of autonomy. Uh, within our programs, we can often be very risk averse. We can often, because we come from hierar hierarchical organizations, want to kind of do stuff to people rather than allow people to think for themselves and take some, uh, makes, take some steps which amount to positive risk taking. So everything I do within my programs, we hope is helping people to achieve a greater level of autonomy. And you can feed these other aspects into the programs as well and build things around those three themes. Other key ingredients that I found are vital to the success of these types of programs are competition. Servicemen and women are competitive by nature. They competed to join the military. They competed to get promoted in the military. They competed to get on career courses. They often want to compete. So this year, we're starting a competition series that will take people who weren't lucky enough to be selected for some of the major events that we do through uh, uh, an optional program of, of nine competitive programs over a series of 12 months. Risk, to me, taking positive risks, taking ownership for yourself, uh, the choices you make, the mistakes you make, and the lessons you learn through that is vital. Otherwise, we're not even going to get close to achieving the levels of post-traumatic growth that we know are possible if we do the right things. And then challenge. Wise's challenge was climbing Mount Everest. Not everybody can climb Mount Everest, but everybody has got a personal Mount Everest to climb. And that, for some people, is getting out of the house, into a car, and driving to a venue to play sport. And uh, we just want to be there to help facilitate that. And through the Invictus program, we were recognizing that once we selected the team, we weren't really providing continued sporting pathways for those who wanted to stay active. So this year, we ran a major event in the city of Sheffield. And uh, here's a short video with some thoughts from the participant, participants about their experiences of that particular competition. <laughs> these men and women are carrying scars and that the sport is there to help them overcome that. It's something that these guys will remember for the rest of their life. For me, it's not about winning medals, it's about taking part. That's what's driving me, it's just improving every little step of the way. We couldn't do it without help for heroes. We couldn't do it without people that support the charity. It's unlocked something in me. I mean, I've, I've, I've known people for decades and they've said that they've never seen me this happy, this put together. But help for heroes do an, an amazing, amazing job and they support in any way they can. I think that the phrase, it's unlocked something within me, is the one that sticks in my mind when I watch that particular video. Now for the sciencey bit. Uh, this is just an example using a fairly standard tool, the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale, of some of the impact that we've had on participants in programs. And these were, these were outdoor activity programs partic uh, in this particular case, but we now have hundreds of data sets from a range of programs and we can evaluate um, you know, the benefits or the impact of outdoor activity programs to team sports programs to other kinds of programs. And in this particular case, uh, we saw a, a really significant difference in the 
uh, well-being of the participants. Um, in the National Health Service, the, the, the average for women is 49, and the average for men is 50. We started at a level of 47 uh, pre-intervention and ended up at a level, a well-being score of 60 post-intervention through those outdoor activity programs. Um, which is pretty cool. And in terms of shift, in terms of sense of uh, feeling of well-being, there was a big shift and nobody was left in the, the low well-being group at the end of those, those courses, which are typically five to ten days in, in, in length. I've, I've nicked a slide from a colleague um, in Canada, Selena Shiraznapur, for the next uh, slide, or nicked a graph for the next slide. Um, and this shows uh, something which I think is quite important, which is the continued sense of improvement in general health and general well-being post doing a major event like the Invictus Games. We often hear that participants fall off the edge of a cliff at the end of a major event. This doesn't seem to be so. There seems to be a normal response to having a fun time and then going back to normal life uh, that any of us would have after we've been on a great vacation or done something else that's really important to us in our lives, perhaps been to a family wedding. Um, but there seems to be a nice carryover effect in improvement in well-being beyond the event itself, which I think is a really, really important sort of finding. What I'm particularly uh, wanting to do, and it resonates with David's talk earlier, is that's to make myself redundant. Make myself redundant in a way that gets people engaging in these activities for the long term within their communities. And they can do that in a number of different ways, through volunteering, through coaching, through fundraising, through becoming role models, becoming members of the Kazivak Club if they meet the criteria, and becoming sort of thought leaders of the future. I've got a little video clip. Now, wouldn't that make for a better world? <laughs> if we could all play sport together on a level playing field and then go for a beer. I thought the Aussies would appear, uh, appreciate a beer advert as well. Um, so I had to get beer in there some way. So we also track trends in, in uh, where sort of interests are changing. And I've already mentioned that competitive sport is, is something that we're finding an increasing level of interest in. Um, it's great because if you're doing a competitive sport, you can set some goals around that much more easily than you can uh, if you're doing stuff just for general well-being. It just seems that most service men and women like to have those competitive targets as well as those other personal targets around their, their health. And uh, I'm finding a big increase in, in strength and power events, both amongst men and women. The final thanks go to our boss. Um, who, uh, who I know, if she was here, would have been delighted to hear all of your talks over the last two days. Uh, thank you very much for listening.